morning, everybody. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Stella Abraham, and I head up the residential leasing and relocation team at JLL. I'd like to introduce you to the members of the panel this morning. Um, at the very far end there is Michelle Lamb, founder of Sport Experiences Group, Emma Reynolds here, co-founder and CEO of E3 Reloaded, and David Lynch in the middle, uh, managing director and head of technology and operations for Hong Kong and China for DBS. Welcome. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the movie series Back to the Future. How many of you, though, can believe that we have just passed that date, October 21st, 2015? The date in the future when in 1989 it was predicted that there would be TV video phones, hello FaceTime, online banking, although sometimes that might not be uh, the truth, sorry David, um, and self-lacing sneakers, which I'm sure Nike were itching to release. Marty McFly and Doc Brown would never have guessed it. Hollywood forecasted that the world would change rapidly, and so it has. The pace of this, cha uh, sorry, this pace of change has created a need for organizations to rethink their approach towards the working environment. For organizations to continue to be competitive, this requires a fundamental assessment of how work is done, the impact of technology, of how we should be organized, but to do so in a way that engages, enables, and energizes. We're fortunate enough to have an assembled a panel of individuals who come from organizations not of different sizes, but also different industries. Firstly, we want to understand a little, though, about you all today. So I need a raising of hands, please. Can I have a show of hands of how many of us would say we work in what would be deemed a corporate company? Oh, well, that's changed everything. We're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> OK, and how many of you would consider yourself Generation Y. Three, four, five. I was going to say Lisa Moore. Put your hand up. You're definitely Gen Y. <laughs> Tom, did you raise your hand there? No, oh, okay. That's a little rich, but yeah, okay. <laughs> Gen Y. <laughs> Great, OK. Um, so let's get a sense of how companies are anticipating breaking down physical barriers um, of work, attempting to embrace new ways of working, and engaging with the multi-generational virtual workforce. So we'll start with the working environment and workplace spaces. As we all know, the traditional environment consists of people going to the office, sitting at the same desk, generally from 9 to 5, or at least until your job's done. Michelle, you founded Spoilt Experiences Group, which is a relatively new online business. Perhaps you can share with us the current working environment and why you think that works and how you anticipate it maybe changing over the next five years. Sure. Um, well, first of all, I'm uh, really happy to be here. Um, thanks, everyone, for inviting me. Um, my, my company, um, um, as Stella briefly um, introduced, you know, we, we do um, experiences, right? Um, all of the staff that we hire are um, young and creative, um, all, all of our offices Gen Y. Um, and uh, everything we do is online. Um, so uh, we have you know, uh, as little paper as possible. Um, everything is hosted in the cloud. Um, we have an open plan office. Um, we use chat a lot. Um, we try and minimize email. Um, over the next five years, at the moment, you know, we still um, need to have a physical office um, because we have phones, we have customer service. Um, we still value the um, sort of uh, ability to collaborate when people are sitting in the same office and able to just talk to each other. Um, but having said that, because we have everything that we do in the cloud, um, people can work from anywhere. They can work from any device. Um, they can work from, uh, you know, uh, they can work from home. They can work from a coffee shop. Um, and um, ideally, um, you know, we would be able to um, scale the business um, without uh, the issue of, of having the overheads of, of an office. Um, so uh, that, that would really be the vision for Great. us. Okay. Um, Emma, you are the CEO and founder of E3 Reloaded, which um, also promises to fundamentally transform businesses by having them rethink the way they treat their workforce. Um, what are your thoughts on how organizations need to think in terms of ensuring an effective working environment, and how do you see it changing? Thanks. Morning, everyone. 
Happy Friday. <laughs> Very excited to be here. Just before I answer the question, just a bit of context. So I spend my days inside large multinationals. So I have a team of 10, relatively small organization, but I spend my, my time inside organizations in almost every country in Asia Pac and spend time in Africa and back in Europe and, and the US. And over the last decade, we've, we've, we've had some insights about organizations and some of the problems and we believe that work is broken and work isn't working. The problems that organizations have around productivity, presenteeism, absenteeism, in disengagement, we would never accept such problems with our customers, but we accept it with our employees. And so the key question in, in, in the, the key phrase in Stella's question was how do organizations need to think if we're going to embrace the future of work? And there's two mindset shifts that, that we talk about with our work with companies. Nothing will change unless we change the way we think about work. And we really need to challenge the system. We need to challenge, we need to find a new status quo. And that there's two mindset shifts that I, I invite us to discuss and debate today. The first one is from control to trust. There is a serious lack of trust in workplaces today. Everyone in this room hires adults and we treat them like children. Signals of distrust are everywhere and I, I will talk about this uh, further throughout the panel. The second shift that needs to happen is for organizations to understand that work doesn't only happen at work. And most of us in this room hire knowledge workers who are paid to think and act, and that doesn't only happen between the hours of nine till five. And so we really need to change the way we think about work. Great, thank you. Um, David, your organization operates in the banking and finance sector, an industry that's renowned for mobilizing a large workforce, <laughs> providing um, a broad array of products and services. Um, how have you seen the working environment change over the past few years? How do you see it changing? But in particular, compliance. Compliance, yes, big, big issue in bank. So, so just a bit of context. I, I basically have the opposite of what Michelle described. Uh, lots of buildings, lots of branches, big offices. Uh, lots of people, uh, and being a bank, uh, we're highly regulated. So one of the biggest uh, issues for any of you who work in financial services at the moment, regulation is a big burden that everyone carries, and there's a certain amount of fear that comes with that. So that permeates its way into the workplace. Um, what, what I see is happening uh, through necessity. You, you can look at the US and European banks are going through quite a crisis. There's a lot of cost-cutting action going on. and. Um, financial institutions are having to rethink the way that they operate. There's a huge transition that's going into digital. I think that's affecting uh, just about every company. Um, we're also grappling with uh, changing work practices associated with the uh, Gen Y population coming in. And I think this is really exciting. I think the Gen Ys are, are challenging a lot of the norms uh, and standards in terms of the way that companies are working. Uh, in DBS, I think the thing that is really helping us make this transition is having a higher purpose. So uh, I've worked in banking for about nine years, not, not a career banker at all. Um, but this, this higher purpose is really what I think is driving us. Our CEO uh, assembled the whole leadership team earlier this year uh, around a mission to make banking joyful. And <laughs> it, it, it uh, and, and, and that was the exa exactly the <laughs> That exactly is a promise, the ladies and gentlemen, we have it here. <laughs> That, that was exactly the same reaction that uh, came from the leadership team when, when this was first introduced. You know, a lot, a lot of bankers thought, you know, that's, that's impossible. How can, how can banking, which has got jargon and paperwork and painful cues and all that, how can actually be joyful? So um, what, what that has really unlocked for us is two major work streams in the bank. One is the customer dimension. We're really focused on starting to reorganize ourselves around customer journeys and this digital transformation. The other is about uh, making working joyful. And uh, a lot of the things that Michelle just talked about is exactly what we're trying to bring into the company. Uh, transforming the way we run meetings, uh, embracing new technologies that help us collaborate, uh, transforming the, the workspace, uh, the, the move to 
uh, temporary labour, the fact that you know work work follows you whether you like it or not into your home in the evening, uh, and how we embrace mobility and great user experience design. So, um, huge program of work around that. Okay. Um, let's talk about technology. Throughout today, I'm sure there'll be <laughs> nobody in this room will not check their email. Um, everybody will respond to at least one, the urgent one, and then we'll flag the others until this afternoon. Um, but I think I'd like you, David, if you can start off the ball rolling, um, just so we can talk about technology and the connectivity and, and all of that. And how do we, how do we go forward? In, and how, where do we see ourselves in 15 years? Yeah, so, so I think to experiment around that, I, I'm a huge believer uh, because I run technology as part of my, my day job about experimenting with new technologies. And we, what we're trying to create inside the bank is almost a, a two-speed IT model. You've got the very traditional enterprise side and you've got a, uh, an innovation side where we give people a very safe uh, test bed to experiment. So um, if I could just talk about some of, the, some of the technologies that we're experimenting with at the moment, I think, you know, Companies like Michelle and Emma work at are using tools like Trello and Slack. Uh, they're really breaking down this um, sort of email warfare that goes on in corporations, getting people to focus on problems very quickly, um, giving them the ability to co collaborate much easier. Uh, we've been using chat for a long time. You know, WhatsApp has really taken off in the enterprise. Being in a bank, we're going to be a bit careful with it. Um, you know, we, can, we can't put customer data in anything in the cloud. so. Uh, that has some restrictions, uh, Internet of Things and, and wearable technology. So we've been running, uh, you know, wearable uh, technology trials within the bank, uh, more focused around employee wellness. Uh, we've been working with partners like Samsung, Microsoft and Amazon uh, to also bring in some of their experimental technology. So in, in Wan Chai, a couple of months back, we, we set up a, a startup accelerator and uh, we've got 10 startups that work in that space, very, very creative space. And what we tried to do is make it a, a showcase of collaboration technology and the Internet of Things. And, uh, you know, we, we found that a really interesting experiment, right, you know, right down to things like um, uh, Bluetooth locks, people can un unlock the doors using their smartphone. And what we're really testing is to see whether these things actually work. So all these, all these sound like great technology, some of them quite frankly end up being uh, gimmicks and we throw them away and we say that it's a ni nice piece of technology but the, uh, the way that people use it actually do doesn't gain traction. So I think in the workplace we've run something like 100 experiments um, over the last year. Um, you know, some might say the, the su success rate is a bit too high. We're probably running at 20, 25 percent, um, maybe 10 percent sort of the standard norm that's used in Silicon Valley. but. Banks have a slightly lower risk profile. So technology, in, in my view, is fundamentally uh, changing the way we work. And it, we've got to embrace it. And uh, we, we're really using, actually, a lot of the Gen Y population to really champion and drive this within the company. Yeah, um, I mean, we, I briefly talked about um, like cloud technology. So we, we really have everything in the cloud. Um, so uh, in terms of our, our project management, um, we use um, we use online CRMs. We use online um, cloud-based uh, project management systems. Um, all of uh, the documents that we create um, are using Google Docs, and we would have co-authoring of documents. Uh, so there's there's none of the sort of problems of version control where you're emailing um, documents from one person to another. I see a lot of nodding heads, so this must happen a lot. Um, uh, and you know the the main the main thing for us is that um, when everything's in the cloud, it means you're device agnostic. So you you can have a computer at work, you can have a computer at home. You equally can just log in um, and uh, you know and perform exactly the same tasks um, just as effectively. Um, but the other thing is, uh, I think a lot of um, people who haven't used cloud um, are worried about security and worried about having um, customer data um, in the cloud. Um, I think, you know, David talked a little bit about this. Um, you know, from our perspective, actually, um, I feel more comfortable with um, our customer data actually um, 
and all of our uh, documents are um, being sat in the cloud because you can actually customize um, down to the document level who has access to what. So people can only have access um, to a certain project or a certain document um, if you give them access. And when they're done with it, you remove it, and they don't, they don't have um, you know a, a, a copy of it sitting on their machine. Um, and you and you know when people leave the company, you can just remove their account, and it's much easier to manage um, you know having all the information in one place. Um, so actually, that, that leads quite nicely into Emma yeah. and talking about trust earlier. Yeah. Uh, you know, that word trust and, and trusting our employees. So maybe you can elaborate a little on that. Sure. So, I, I'll, I'll get to that. I was just going to pick up on, on the technology piece. So, so what we do is we study, I spend a lot of time studying problems and I obsess over them and really try and get to the core of what are causing the problems that, that we have inside organizations. And I think no, no technology or no new system or tool will work unless we change the behavior and the mindset. And we were talking about this when we were prepping is this, this mindset around, or this, this behavior around real time. And imagine if, I mean, how many people use TripAdvisor? and have left a rating or a, a ranking for anything. Imagine if you were only allowed to do that once a year. Or if it wasn't peer to peer. You know, if in a, as humans, our behavior has changed drastically and our level of access to information, transparency, peer to peer ratings, reviews, et cetera, outside of work. And then we come into work and we have annual appraisal reviews, or maybe it's uh, bi biannually now, or we have a survey once a year to measure engagement. Would we do that with our customers? Imagine if we only measured our customer satisfaction once a year and had a little check-in. And so it's how can we embrace this real time, peer-to-peer, -peer, study that, kind of understand that behavior and that mindset that we already embrace outside of work. And until we can adopt that and trust people, then no system or whether it's Trello or the things that you, it, it won't work. It will break down because we have old mindsets and, and we, which I guess leads to trust. So how many people in this room, if you, if you thought about it, the, the signals of distrust that you could find in your organization if you go looking for them? Now, individually, they might not seem like much, but when you add them all together, there is nothing more demeaning and demotivating for employees than not being trusted to act like a responsible adult. But signals of distrust are everywhere. Signs in the bathroom telling you how to wash your hands, telling you how to walk down a staircase, no access to USB files without a password protected uh, system can't make international calls, can't access the network outside of the office, need to get expenses approved by more than one person, need to get approval to sign off spend of $50, minuscule amounts, have to be at the office between nine till five, have set number of days holidays. The signals of distrust are everywhere. We treat, we treat employees like children. Okay. Um, so, Technology, it doesn't really matter what we get. At the end of the day, if we don't trust anybody, it doesn't make a difference. Let's talk differently now about communication and branding. It's one of my favorite topics. Um, I'm assuming we're all uh, tweeting this morning, hopefully, anyway. Um, I've certainly been tweeting. Um, we've checked in on Facebook. I definitely did that. Um, and then, obviously, you know, there'll be self selfies on Instagram, and one of you will connect with somebody else on LinkedIn, I'm sure. Um, Eva, given your company specializes in helping the companies with strategies, perhaps, perhaps you can start this discussion rolling about uh, communication and branding. Sure. I think the, the biggest opportunity and what I spend my life doing is helping organizations understand that treating your employees like customers is the future of business. And another mindset shift that we help organizations understand is this shift from expecting loyalty and expecting that you have people's attention to earning it. And that's a fundamental shift that we have to make that loyalty is no longer a given. And we understand this as marketers or with our customer or client base. 
we wouldn't dream of expecting loyalty and we earn it and we design amazing experiences and it's intuitive and it's exciting and the language we use is very uh, emotional and we connect with people and we definitely don't expect we, that we have people's attention but with employees we expect loyalty and we do very little to deserve it and we expect that we have people's attention. And so that all of the communication and branding efforts that we do internally is around getting people's attention and treating employees like customers. And how can we design an experience, not a process? How can we make this relevant and personalize the content or whatever we're doing, just like we would with our customers? Yeah, well, I, I love the message around in, uh, treating employees like customers. It's quite, quite similar to what we're, we're trying to do in the bank. I think we've got um, quite a number of channels we're using really around the employee, employee brand. Um, so in the social media space, we've got uh, two very popular channels that we have. One is around employee wellness. Uh, so we've got you know a number of posts that come throughout every day, whether it's people out hiking or playing sports or healthy eating. Um, really encouraging our employees to take a broader interest in, in their uh, wellness. Um, that really started again with a, a wearable technology trial. We bought some Fitbits uh, for a number of staff to see how that how that worked. It wasn't wasn't a great success, to be honest. Um, we, 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 not not on the technology, but the the traction that we've got on the social channel has been long lasting, and we've got quite a number of success stories you know, around people who've um, you know lost weight or feel a lot healthier as a result. Uh, we've got similar exercise around the digital transformation and uh, we've got a separate Facebook group that is very active where people are constantly looking for new ideas um, and some of those result in experiments in the office so you know I was thinking about a few technologies that we're experimenting with now you know sometimes it's interesting to, to look at these not saying we're necessarily going to use them but we're, we're looking at them one's called uh, Pecon uh, which is more real-time uh, employee feedback uh, an interesting new startup Another one we looked at is called Achievers. So some of you, some of your companies may actually use that. I think Deloitte's a company that was quite famous for being an early adopter of that. Uh, and, and also I think around the whole communication on our digital transformation. So we built a, a video streaming platform. You know, when I, when I joined the bank two and a half years ago, all the top-down communication was all emails. People don't really read it. Uh, they're just inundated with email. We're, we're creating a lot more emotionally engaging videos to convey messages. Uh, we do a simple thing every every Friday, a uh, short two-minute video about something that's going digital. It can be a workplace experiment, uh, it can be a customer-facing activity, it could be a standing desk trial. Um, we we want to make sure that all these things reach everyone in the bank, and it's quite hard to do that from a you know from an ivory tower. You know we've got people out in out in a branch network serving customers, so uh, video has been extremely impactful as a way of communicating in the bank over the last two years. Michelle, I mean, you know, it's sitting exactly opposite me and I'm craving some days I walk out because I work in a very corporate company and I do walk out and think, oh, a cloud, how delightful, that would be wonderful. <laughs> what about yourself with branding and communication particularly? Um, I think uh, for in terms of employer brand that, um, you know, Emma was mentioning, um, we actually work with a lot of companies that um, are using um, their reward and recognition systems really to um, adapt to uh, a more diverse uh, uh, workforce. So for example, um, like Emma was saying, you can't just give sort of uh, performance reviews once a year because things happen during the year and it's better to give instant feedback and to have instant sort of performance improvements. And so, um, so we actually work with some companies that have um, reward systems, right? So reward and recognition um, programs. So you know, small rewards um, for um, you know getting uh, giving good customer service and getting guest mentions, um, uh, hitting sales targets. Um, and um, for for us, because um, we specialize in things like vouchers for you know spa days, helicopter rides, cooking classes, and things like that. Um, and um, for companies to give employees a reward for sort of an experience where you know they would be able to go out with you know their partner or their families um, uh, is instead of giving sort of like a small cash bonus um, there's actually a lot of um, uh, research about uh, you know motivating employees and um, and so for sort of Gen Y employees um, it 
there's a sort of like a wow factor, um, you know, in terms of the kind of rewards that people can get. Um, and I think the issue of choice is an important one. So when you have multi-generational employees, you have, you know, you have your baby boomers, you have your Gen X, you have your Gen Y, everyone wants something different, right? Um, and so, you know, in terms of how your employees are rewarded, um, in terms of the benefits that they get, um, it's it, you have to give them choice um, so that they feel they have ownership of what they're receiving from the company and that they're actually being valued by the company. Um, one of the things that um, we do, um, because you know I have a different starting point from David, you know when I started the company. Um, just you know, five years ago, you know, we could sort of design everything from scratch, um, and so one of the things what I looked at was um, was benefits. Um, so I was like, okay, so we could give all of our employees medical benefits. Um, it's actually it's not mandatory in Hong Kong, but it's custom uh, that you know uh, companies would provide this. Um, but all of my employees are young. Like, do they actually care about this? Like, they they are all young and active. They they don't think that they need to go to the doctor, right? But this is costing me money, um, and is this reflecting well on my employer brand? Um, and so what I did was, um, because we do experiences, a, a lot of the um, people that we hire are self-selecting. They like to do fun and interesting, uh, creative things. And so we have what we call like a spoil yourself allowance. So f it's, it's, a, it's a benefit where you can um, use it on anything like, learning a new skill, go volunteering, go traveling, um, um, any kind of sort of experiences. Um, or you can use the same um, pot of money for medical expenses, um, which the company would reimburse you for. Um, and then you have the choice to s decide how to spend it, one or the other, or a mix of both, right? Um, so far, 100% of our employees have used it on um, on activities um, and not um, <laughs> medical benefits, but I mean, and we, you know, we do have um, you know slightly older employees that do have families, and you know, and, and they would care about the medical side of things. So I mean, this is just you know very sort of small scale type of benefit program that I can offer my employees, um, but it's it's a, sort of a way that um, I can offer choice to um, to you know a, a changing workforce that um, that expects um, sort of this type of engagement okay um, so well you're not going to be okay because I'm going to tell I'm going <laughs> to open open a question for you about choice which again it relates to trust so choice um, is something that the large corporates with compliance do struggle particularly um, to give people but can you talk more about choice choices I Sure. We work a lot in financial services as well. And something I've been asking myself and the people I work with is, when did flexibility and compliance become mutually exclusive? And can flexibility and compliance coexist? And we're starting, and so maybe that's a question to, to David as well. Uh, so, so, you know, choice, we, we all have choice. Um, now more than ever before, we can choose where we work. We can change jobs often. We choose how much energy we commit every time we walk through the doors of, of an organisation. How many, you know, our ideas, our effort, our motivation. We're, we're continually making choices about whether we stay, join, commit, etc. And and I think organisations, if they realise that loyalty is no longer a given. How do we make sure that we're getting people to choose ideas, effort, energy, motivation, staying with an organisation rather than either presenteeism, which is like the plague in Hong Kong, uh, or leaving leaving the organisation? David, do you want to add on that? Yeah, I, I think to add a little bit, uh, probably for a big corporate, we're not quite as uh, you know advanced, I think, as the things that Michelle's doing in terms of benefits flexibility, but we do have a program we call iFlex where uh, staff are given a, an allowance and they can spend that on gym membership or healthcare and uh, we're about to run a, another wearable trial so we've got uh, self-selecting groups uh, entering to a step challenge and that's going right across the bank. Uh, I think it starts in about a week. So I'm trialling this uh, fit, fit bug on, on my, my right wrist at the moment, uh, seeing how that works. 
Um, and, and huge uptake, actually. A lot of interest in it. So everyone's really excited about that. I, I think um, sort of back to choice, the, the, uh, Google was very famous for having Google time, uh, you know, sort of one day a week where people can self-select a project to work on as well. And I think something that is working quite well for us in the bank is giving people a, a very comfortable space away from the day job uh, where we, we take them into a different physical space. Uh, they can dress differently. Um, they can engage in hackathons or makeathons. They can self-select projects to work on that broadly relate to our digital transformation. And uh, we re review those as a management team. So uh, about once every two weeks, I dedicate uh, time to this uh, innovation forum where they can present ideas. Um, I'd be very open about though, not everyone self-selects into this program. Uh, in fact, if you look at the, you know, the entire workforce population, it's probably still a relatively small number. Uh, much larger proportion, are, again, gen-wise, not completely, but uh, much larger portion. And um, there's enough critical mass now that it's making a real difference in the company. Um, but as I said, not everyone wants that. There's still a large portion of the workforce that are very happy just coming in and doing their work and going home at night. Uh, they may not be so interested in all this uh, workplace transformation. So uh, it takes time. It's not, it's not easy at all in a big enterprise. It takes a lot of effort. OK, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to talk about engage, uh, engaging, enabling, and energizing, because I think those are the three E's that we have, um, we've touched on and we, we want to uh, discuss, I think, we know we have a diverse group of people in this room, never, never mind out in our own workforces. But what's um, an insight or some bit of advice you can give us to, um, to energize and uh, enable and then also to engage? Sure. So we get asked a lot about different generations and how, uh, cultures as well and the male feet. The, the, however way you can segment and, and, and target your audience, we try we try and remove all of the labels and get down to what are, what are basic human needs, whether you're male, female, Chinese, Australian, uh, in financial services or in tech or Gen Y or baby boomer. We want to feel trusted. We want to feel understood. And we want to feel like we're contributing and we're making a difference and we're adding value. And so when we're doing big change programs, we try and avoid the labels and we go out and we seek to connect with people. I think the number one, well, there's many actually, but one of the things missing inside organisations is empathy. Going out and seeking to understand the audiences that you're designing things for. You know, people that design policies. When's the last time they went out and had empathy for the users? particularly global, there's no such thing as a global policy anyway, but particularly people who design global policies and processes and systems and procedures for an internal audience. We don't talk about our users and their needs, frustrations, their unmet needs. Let's test and prototype in the same way that we do with our customers. And when you have empathy, when you listen, you know, when people feel listened to, people often ask me what I do. And, and I say, I listen all day, every day. I go out into organizations, I go out into the field and I listen and I have empathy for the people. And then often the problems that we're trying to solve are not the problems at all that we need to solve. And, and organizations spend a great deal of time solving the wrong problems. And so when you have empathy, when you listen, when people feel understood, regardless of age or nationality or culture, then you can create real change. David, anything? Well, I, th I think one example of how we did that, I mean, again, it's a, it's a big company. We have about 20,000 employees or thereabouts. So one, one of the ways that we, we did some listening, we created a, an idea jam. So back to uh, making banking joyful, what we were trying to do is to get, to get our employees to, to be as honest as they could in, a, in an open forum in talking about all the impediments to doing that. And uh, that went on for about a week. We really encouraged all the senior leadership to be uh, very visible and to contribute in that. And what, what we did it, as an outcome from that uh, is to extract those very clear messages that were coming through in employees to create a dedicated program of work around making working joyful. And surprise, surprise, the, 
we, we came up with 10 things that are very much the things that we're talking about on the panel here. You know, too many emails, the way we run meetings are too bureaucratic. We need more focus on wellness. We need to experiment more and more in the workplace. Policies, wow, that was, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a bank, um, you know, of course there were some favorite ones. There were, there were some ones that, you know, really came through strongly there. So we've got a program of work around addressing policies, making them more employee centric. Um, be, being on the technology side, I, I think one of the other challenges we had was, you know, we've worked with some of the some of the world's best design companies to help us design these customer facing applications. But, you know, to our Gen Ys when they come in the company and see some of the enterprise software that they have to use, it's it's uh, it's quite it's quite deflating, you know, to <laughs> to to say the least. So you know, we're also putting a lot of focus on enterprise apps. Um, you know, trying to make the employee experience very much like what they have on the home screen of their smartphone and, uh, you know, using the same kind of technology. So, you know, it's, it's a big program of work. I, I guess the only other piece of advice uh, I give about that, and, it, you know, it's, this is not necessarily a, a bank-wide view, it's more, you know, my team, I really believe that if you're going to be serious about this, you've got to put real resources behind it. So uh, outside of HR, I have a dedicated people operations team. Uh, unashamedly, it was a concept that we uh, we kind of copied from Google uh, because they're they're really good at making decisions based on data, not always based on hierarchy and uh, emotion. So I've got a team of three people that do nothing but uh, employee engagement. They're constantly listening. Uh, they drive a lot of these experiments, whether they're online or offline or digital. Um, and you know, we we learn a lot from that. So yep. So I'm actually going to open it up to the floor now and make this more of a discussion between all of us. We're small enough room, I think. So um, I think there's a microphone out there, is there? Or I'll just pass mine round and then Emma will have to maybe speak loudly. Um, I'm hoping lots of... I can hear lots of scribbles, so I'm hoping that lots of people have got lots of questions. So who wants to get this conversation started? Sounds like a disco song, doesn't it? Um, I think one of the old mindsets of work is uh, work location, so physically being based at the office. And I think in Hong Kong, it's quite um, prevalent FaceTime. Uh, so not the app, the you know being present in front of your <laughs> being present in front of your boss, right? I think that's quite a Hong Kong local cultural thing. Um, have you seen any you know successful moves of change towards this? I think it would be quite supportive for families with young children, or you know those type of things. Have you seen any successful changes towards changing this? Uh, yes, yeah, in organisations that we work with and in our own organisations, and it comes back to changing what you seek to control. And, and when organisations relinquish control over where people work and when they work uh, and focus on what they're doing and the, con and the outcomes, then, then all of a sudden flexibility and um, being able to manage your own schedule and not having to be in an office at a certain time. Uh, so, so yeah, we see, it, we see it inside a lot of organizations that we work with and it's, not, it's, not a, it, it's more than a flexi time policy. You know, I think we speak to a lot of organisations now that are still debating whether they can have a work from home policy or not. And I get really tempted to just walk out of the meeting and think the amount of hours that are wasted on conversations should we have... It's wrong conversation. Let's get down to... Tr do we trust the adults that we've hired to perform and work in the best interests of the organisation? And until you can answer yes to that, there's no point having any conversation about pol work from home policy policies, etc. And, uh, and yeah, so, so there are organisations that uh, are embracing the, the relinquishing control over where, when, what. I mean, we ask, why do we still have a rush hour? It's insane. In Jakarta, people spend five hours a day stuck in traffic. In Bangkok, it's horrible. In Mumbai, in Lagos, in Hong Kong. Why do we still have a rush hour? <laughs> Lots of hands go up on that one. Oh, you do have another mic. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Actually, the question I want to ask spans the world of Emma and David. I work for a company that is a big multinational and I would say that we tick the boxes on, all, on many of the things that you say. So the company I work for is Pearson. Uh, we 
Uh, we have social media everywhere. We have very flexible work from home policies. Um, as CEO, we just issued a profit warning and people are on the chat talking to the CEO and questioning his uh, questioning how the company is going. So in many, many ways, we've made a gigantic shift. We work off Gmail. We don't have, we, we kicked out Microsoft years ago. The question I have though, is around actually a business in transition because we're also a company that is a changing of the guards. And even though we can tick all these boxes, I would say that our employee engagement is struggling in many ways because the company in some pockets in making that change is not always as successful as we're hoping to be at the moment. So I'm seeing the, the two behaviours between the big corporate world and actually how does that, that alone is not driving success. So how do you make the transition? It's, I think it's quite difficult for companies that have been big traditional multinationals. And I'm interested to get perhaps your perspective and, and also David's working on the other side of that. Yeah, I, I think I think what you've articulated in your question is, is a huge challenge and, and honestly I, I struggle with it, so does our entire management team. I, I, I go back to the comment I made around purpose. I, I think uh, inside the bank, you know, and time will tell a course in these things, but three words are making a really big difference. Uh, it's driving the way we make decisions, it's driving where we make investments. Uh, the reality is we've got a lot of people in the bank today that, that have a day job to do. And whilst we're making this huge shift to digital, uh, you've still got to keep the bank running. And 80% of the workforce that, that I have are, are run the bank uh, kind of people. So um, I think we, as, we, as we start to embrace all these flexible work practices, we've also got to acknowledge that uh, the nature of each job is different. And we can't sort of paint everyone with the same brush. So I think the, the way that seems to be working that is addressing that is you know, carving out dedicated pools of resources that are, are driving the new model and making sure that those people that are keeping the bank running are, are getting the same level of recognition and uh, reward for, for keeping the, the bank running and keeping things safe and controlled and, uh, and all of that. And admittedly, I, I, I struggle with it because I'm always very conscious that, you know, as we go through this change naturally as leaders, we're very, uh, we get very excited by all the new things and all the, all the change that happens and sometimes the people that are um, you know, really keeping the performance and keeping the numbers ticking over, you know, can feel a bit left out in that. So um, sometimes that comes through our engagement surveys. Um, you know, I have to do a lot of offline events to go out and constantly meet with people. Um, I guess one, one very, very simple story, and it, it may be, maybe not a, a nice analogy, but I think also, you know, my, my seven-year-old daughter uh, asked me a question the other night. She said, Daddy, what does, what does isolated mean? And she was doing some research on cockroaches, of all things. And, <laughs> and I said, why are you asking? She said, well, you know, if cockroaches are isolated, it, you know, they, they die. And I was like, OK, I didn't know that. That's an interesting, <laughs> inter interesting ob observation. But, but, but I think, you know, as, as we look at all this, you know, flexible work and all of these things, I, I've tried with it myself. I think we can't lose sight of the fact that people are social animals and we need FaceTime and we need interaction with each other. And it's really important we don't lose that. Um, I think work from home sort of part of the time can actually work. Obviously, there's companies that have to do it out of necessity. But if you want to create a great organisation culture, um, it's, it's really important that people have the chance to interact face to face. And I know that's something our CEO really believes in too. So I, need, I think I need to, I have questions back for you. I, I need to understand a bit more about the problems that you're having. I said I study problems. So I, I, I don't know that I understand the question from, from my perspective. So where, where are you having problems? What, what, what are the root causes of some of the problems that you're having? Or where, where is it legacy mindsets? Or is it half the organisation is embracing and the other half isn't? Or what? I think that the the organisation is embracing, but when you at times when you're going through difficult times, I guess you get a um, in terms of that trust perspective, you end up having be, other behaviours have to come in on clamping down, on restructuring. Those kind of things do, sometimes don't always work in parallel with that open it's that open trust because sometimes difficult things have to happen. And I guess 
on the one hand, when things are going always fantastically, it's great. You know, everyone's feeling great about it. But when you have to really focus on the hard edge of business at times, it becomes that conflict. And I think I would probably articulate the, the issue relating to employee engagement is perhaps that conflicting message that necessarily happens at times when a company is, is changing or, or trying to break into new markets that's not always, um, you know, it, it does take some really tough focus and, yeah, so. And I think it's, it's the, we're just at a particular point with which that's impacting employee engagement. Yeah, maybe I can add, add a little bit on that. I mean, I don't want to, I've been with DBS two and a half years, obviously, since I've joined, you know, everything's pretty good at the moment. Um, my previous employer was standard chartered now I was, I was they're going through quite a quite a tough period at the moment. Um, I think the the need for really strong leadership when times are tough and not deviating from the stated intent drastically where you compromise your values is so important and that was one of the uh, one of the issues that I experienced in my last couple of years. you know we, we used to have this thing about massively multiplying leadership and then you know read. 15,000 layoffs yesterday and or day before and uh, here for good, you know, all these sort of things, you know. So employees look for signaling around those things. It's really, really important employees, I think, to belong to something that has a higher purpose. And, uh, you know, Standard Charter was a great bank, probably still is a great bank. It's going through a tough time, but um, I struggled to reconcile some of that myself. And I think the need for leadership to stand up and be true to the the stated values uh, in tough times is really, really critical. That'd be the only other thing I'd say. I mean, ha yeah, ha happy to pick up afterwards and have a conversation. I think just my my comment. I don't know if this is answering the question or not, but there, there, ha there. Of course, there has to be consequence. You know, like anything in life. And I think if if the business is going through difficult times, it's focusing on what has led to that and really trying to understand that and not just cutting off all of a sudden there's no trust anymore or no flexibility or no, you know, everybody needs to, to, to come back in the organisation. It's kind of understanding where the organisation is at and what's going to need to happen in order to turn it around. And then if people are underperforming or teams are underperforming, then there are consequences. I don't know if that helps, but we can explore a little bit. Just a quick question back to Emma. Assuming these changes that you make in your work, in your um, the companies that you work with, um, result in happier employees, does that then translate? And are you able to document it that that means increased profits? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every single thing we do is tied to organizational performance, and uh, and quantifying what we do because otherwise it becomes. Uh, fluffy and this this conversation that's not taken seriously. So where we start with a baseline, here is uh, every metric we can get our hands on uh, related to customer or client or revenue, profit or um, employee costs, hard costs, soft costs, everything. And once we go through a program of change and it takes a long time and it's not easy, we absolutely link everything to hard business metrics. Can I add, add something to that? So, so in the course of the work we did around um, employee engagement, uh, we studied these, they're called EXOs, ex exponential organizations. So you can think of like Uber's a often talked about one at the moment. But wh what I thought was really interesting, you know, this idea jam that we ran and these 10 things that we needed to change, there was almost 100% almost correlation between the characteristics of these exponential organizations and the things that we found we needed to fix. And these exponential organizations have been able to achieve growth and profitability um, really at a scale that no bank can really achieve. So we're trying to see what we can learn from that. But there's a lot of science, I think, that sits behind saying that having incredibly engaged and happy employees translates directly into financial success as well. Um, Jennifer Vandale, um, I'm at Eversheds and I'm on the board at AmCham. Um, and it's just a comment and I'd be interested in your, your perspectives. Um, I'm an employment lawyer, so also known as a killjoy. Um, <laughs> okay. And the, the 
the, the, the legislative framework, so the legal framework that we're all working in, um, you know, the, the legislation could be subtitled how to not trust your employees. It's very, very rigid. Um, just an example, um, annual leave. Um, you know, you, you, the employer is the one who tells the employee when they can go on vacation. Um, thankfully, most of my clients ignore that, but, but that's what the law says. Um, you have to grant it in very specific blocks. You can't give people half days. It's, it's almost designed to impede implementing a very flexible workforce. Um, so just, you know, in terms of that, in terms of maybe advocacy, et cetera, um, I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that. Just, just how it, you know, what we're supposed to be doing, what the law says, and the fact that sometimes there are criminal, you know, offenses um, if you don't comply with the law, even though market practice is to not comply. Yeah, try, yeah they, they look at me because we're regulated. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yes, being, being a bank, I, I mean, I think it, right, right from onboarding, yes, it is, it is very stringent. Um, but having said that, you know, going back to the sort of things that Emma's doing, one of, one of the focus areas of, of the 10 things we're working through is the, we call them the, the 10 signature employee experiences. So onboarding is, is one of those. So we, you know, we, we, we still give people a, a DVD, believe it or not, when they, when they, when they go through the onboarding. So they're, they're these kind of things and they get a big stack of paper when they come in and, you know, it's not digital and we're not, we're not sort of giving, giving them, uh, you know, a nice video from the CEO when they join and make them feel part of a really great club. But there are technology and tools out there that I think are enabling compliance in the course of a, a whole onboarding journey uh, easier than what it's been in the past. Obviously, being a bank, we're subjected to AML uh, scrutiny and we've got all kinds of burden around labor law and these kind of things, but it is improving. I honestly don't, I don't feel burdened by the labor law. Yeah, I don't feel that the labor law is a burden. I feel that our internal process and way of doing things is a much bigger burden than actually what the law is. And I think we get very good legal advice. We've got a you know, great legal team like most big corporates. So um, yeah, I, I don't feel that it is, is such a big problem. Yeah, I mean, um, for example, annual leave is one of those things you can't get around, like you have to track annual leave because you know it directly translates into into pay. Um, uh, for us, I mean, um, we're, I mean, people have to apply for annual leave because we need to know when they're not going to be in the office if we need to sort of cover for them. So we still can't sort of get around that. But, um, but you know, we have things like, you know, people, um, people need to be out of the office to, to do things. You know, they maybe have an appointment or something. But um, just the sort of the way um, we work, we're, we're very flexible, right? So you can, um, if, you, if you have an appointment at home, you need to take a delivery, you can just work at home. That's fine. And then we wouldn't, we, we wouldn't sort of track those days as part of sort of annual leave or anything um, same same for sick leave we don't really um, especially have to track that um, you know we just allow our employees to um, sort of take their discretion at you know when it would be better for them not to be spreading germs in the office you know um, so I think it's um, we, we track what we need to track in just in, term, in terms of what we need to <coughs> write in the employer's return <laughs> for regulation reasons but um, other than that um, we try and give our employees as much um, flexibility as possible because okay. we focus on output rather than you know input. Mm. So my, my view is I, I, the, the law doesn't need to be an excuse. And I think what we see is that it, it's an excuse to do nothing or to play it safe. And mo every policy is designed around the lowest common denominator. And so there's 2% of people that may do something wrong. So let's design uh, a rule and a policy to protect the organization against the 2%. But in doing so, you hold the 98% hostage who have the intention of turning up to do the right thing. And I think I, I, I think of a parallel in, in our lives as humans and citizens. You know, there are thousands of laws that exist 
in in our daily lives around not stealing and not killing people and and the, think about the laws that exist but as we interact on a daily basis we're not constrained by those laws you know things aren't bolted down everywhere we walk around and there's not um, people in in handcuffs we're not handcuffed making sure we don't kill people you know that and I think there's thousands of laws but we don't constrain our customers around those laws. You know, we design for the 98% in the customer space, but we design for the 2% inside, inside our organizations. Hi, good morning. We're affiliated with an educational institution, and while there's um, a great deal of creativity that goes on um, in the classrooms, it, it's, there's still a great deal of tradition as far as um, and prescription as far as contact hours and days that children have to be in school and hours that teachers have to be there um, and when holidays happen. And I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, um, and also policies that govern, policies on policies that govern everything we do. So how do you see the future of work translating into uh, an industry that really is quite tradition bound, um, like education? I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, how is this going to work within our school? And I, I'd love to get some feedback from all of you. Um, I, I can take that. Um, I um, uh, I do a lot of um, one of my other roles is I do a lot of work with um, Chinese International School. Um, I'm, I'm an alum there, and um, and um, they're actually changing um, the way exactly what you were saying in terms of how how school is run. So how curriculum is run. Um, it. it it's not one size fits all um, for adults in terms of work, and it's definitely not one size fits all in terms of kids and and their school um, curriculum. So um, CIS is doing some you know great stuff in terms of um, developing programs um, that allow kids from all different year groups to um, participate in um, specific topics like robotics or um, uh, craft or three D printing. Um, but um, outside of that, um, then you know, I I I hire um, a lot of people uh, from uh, local schools that or have graduated from uh, international schools, um, and um, so when they come into the workforce, you can really see the kind of um, environment that they have been schooled in, and um, and yes, it, there's there's a huge difference um, in terms of, in terms of the grads that I see. Um, one of the things that I try and find out um, about the interview candidates, I, I sort of, I actually almost skip over the academic results. Um, and I ask them, what do you do on their weekends? Um, what are your hobbies? Um, and that tells you a lot more about the person in terms of um, how much initiative they take um, and what what they choose to do with their free time tells you a lot more about that person than what they had to do in school. Um, so, you know, I would say in adapting to the kind of um, workplaces um, we have now, um, we need um, this sort of schooling environment um, to help the sort of kids adapt um, and to be able to take the initiative to chart their own course in terms of their education. I think just uh, just a, a, yeah a comment a comment from me on that. There will always there will always be jobs that are required to work within set hours. You know, in 15 years, in 2030, we're still going to need pilots to fly our planes. We're still going to need waitresses with ba banks that we go in, and there are jobs that will need to, that that have to operate in certain hours. We. For, for the rest of our time, we can't ignore that. But we can innovate within constraints. So we can innovate around scheduling the, the how often they work, when they work, the hours, et cetera. And, and, uh, and so I think what I'm not saying is that every single job on earth sh should be able to work whenever you want, wherever you went, whoever you want. I'm not saying that. There are, there are constraints and there are, there are certain jobs, education, you still need to go to school and you need to get. But within those constraints, let's innovate and let's rethink think how we structure scheduling the, the, the work that needs to get done.
Um, it sounds like this topic could keep going. We're now running at, I think, 10, 26, 27. So um, I just want to sort of round up and thank the panelists themselves. We've got half an hour of networking um, or hammering these three for some more ideas. Um, hopefully, it's given you a little bit of an insight as to where we all might be in 2030. Um, but we'll wait to see. I mean, that's all we can do at this point. Hopefully, make some changes um, from the bottom, from the top, from the middle, from everywhere, and uh, go from there. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.